This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion on the history of abortion legislation. La Sierra University professor Alicia Gutierrez Romine speaks about laws and policies regarding the procedure. Beginning in the 19th century, she tracks changes in medical practice and public opinion through court cases and newspaper coverage. She also describes procedure restrictions, access to illegal abortions, costs, and health risks in different time periods. All right, everyone, welcome back. This week, we're looking at the topic of abortion. And in class on Tuesday, we watched the film Abortion Stories Women Tell. And that was looking at some of the more current debates about abortion now. It was looking at uh, abortion in states that had begun to legislate abortion restriction. So today, we're actually going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to give some historical context. We're going to do a historical overview of the topic of abortion. Uh, We're gonna start nationally, and then we're going to look at California specifically, uh, specifically on the topics of uh, specialized abortion or abortion specialists and decriminalization. And then we're going to go back to the national context to look at Roe v. Wade, and then some of the legislation that has happened since then and in some of the more recent years. Um, So if you recall from around you know, week one or two, we did have a very brief introduction to the topic of abortion in the colonial period. Uh, We talked about Sarah Grosvenor and um, her abortion in the 1740s. Um, So we had a very brief introduction to it. But today we're actually going to pick up uh, around the time of the Comstock Act. So does everyone remember the Comstock Act from a couple weeks ago? Do you, can someone remind us what the Comstock Act is? Yeah, Andrea. No advertising of any type of sexual contraceptives or information on um, uh, Planned Parenthood or anything like that. Yeah, so no advertising of contraceptives and especially the dissemination of this stuff in the mail. So, good. The Comstock Act effectively made it criminal to advertise these things beginning around 1873. Now, we, we showed you guys the political cartoon. If you recall, Comstock was carrying a woman, and the caption was, she gave birth to a naked baby, you know? Uh, and so the joke or the punchline is that Comstock was really prude. Now, it's important to know that he doesn't oppose all methods of birth control. He does encourage couples to use methods of birth control that he considers dignified or ethical. And so those methods include abstinence, Um, They also include the rhythm method, where you avoid sexual intercourse at moments when a woman is more fertile, um, but also sleeping in different beds. So these are things that he's okay with. But he doesn't like other types of birth control. He doesn't like condoms, douches, diaphragms, or abortion because of their connection to the vice trade. Now, we mentioned when we were talking about the progressive era and women's reform movements that uh, these types of birth control had been linked to vice industries, um, simply as a matter of a a vocation, that sometimes women who were prostitutes employed these different methods just because they need to continue working. So when we're putting this, again, back in the context, this is a refresher uh, of the 19th century, and we're looking at gender ideology, separate spheres, and race suicide, if you are an educated, middle and upper class white woman, and you want to use these types of methods, they're at best frowned upon, uh, and again, if you're married, um, and at worst, they're immoral. And if you're a single woman who is attempting to use any of these other methods, or any of the methods, you are considered immoral. So let's look at an example of a 19th century abortionist. Now, uh, this is the example of Madame Restel. Now, her name was first Anne Tro. She was born in 1812, and she was the woman you went to if you wanted an abortion in New York City from 1837 through 1878. Now, in 1836, she married a man named Charles Lohman, and that's when she began to embark on this career as uh, a professor of women's medicine, uh, a midwife, but also an abortionist and purveyor of contraceptives. And her husband supported her in this. They were in this together. So they sold patent medicines that may or may not have been effective, but they made most of their money providing abortions, illegal abortions. She became very well known 
Um, and she often came under scrutiny from various different religious and moral reform groups in New York City. 1841 was the year of her first trial, and she was charged with performing an abortion on a woman and resulting in her death. She does have se uh, several various uh, subsequent brushes with the law, um, but some of the critics against her cited the fact that she donated to political campaigns, that she had the police department on her payroll. Um, she always seemed to get off easy, and sometimes she even just settled out of court. So in the one trial, after which she's found guilty and actually does have to serve time in prison, that was her trial in 1847, she received such special treatment in prison that the city council actually investigated, and the warden of the prison ended up getting fired. So upon her release from prison in 1847, they continued their work, and they were so profitable in this that when their, her stepdaughter got married in 1854, she actually is rumored to have given them a $50,000 wedding gift, $50,000 in 1854, and paid for their European honeymoon. So they were doing quite well. Uh, they also managed to buy a four-story brownstone on Fifth Avenue, which is very prime real estate in New York City. So they're not, they're not slumming it over there. After Charles died, it looked like Anne was going to retire. But in 1878, Anthony Comstock disguised himself as a potential customer. He approached her, and he pretended to need contraceptive materials. He made a bunch of purchases, and he used those to collect a search warrant, and then he had her raided. And she was brought to trial for violation of the Comstock Act. She did try to do some legal maneuvering. She had her attorney try to help her out, but it was all to no avail. It seemed like she was actually really going to do hard time for this trial. And so on April 1st, 1878, the day that her trial was supposed to begin, she slit her throat with a carving knife in her bathtub. So that's what this artist renditioning is trying to show. Now, some people did cr uh, criticize Comstock for entrapment, but he was really nonchalant about it. He called it a bloody end to a bloody life. Um, and when she actually died, her estate was valued at about a million dollars, which is more, over $25 million today. Questions so far? Comstock wasn't the only person who was opposed to abortion at this time. And it's important to note that the 19th century is an era of transition when we're looking at the abortion business. There had been earlier arguments against abortion before this, um, but when you couple this with mass media, you couple this with um, the spread of print material, this wide dissemination of ideas and advertisements, it affords greater opportunity for this previously taboo subject to kind of become open and well-known in the public, and people can discuss and talk about it a little bit more. So in the 1820s and 1830s, we begin to see some territories and state actually beginning to imp implement some of the first abortion laws. Uh, and most of these legislators imagine that these laws are a form of consumer protection that they are creating these laws in order to protect women. Now, since there is increased medical and technological um, advancements that's going on in this era, you do have new methods of birth control, new methods of abortion that are untested, um, and that can be really crude if performed in the wrong hands. So this image, for example, is of a serrated curette. It is a long, kind of spoon-like device. Uh, you can't tell, but it is serrated. And so this would be used to perform an abortion. And it, you would dilate the cervix, you would insert this device and scrape the uterine walls. Um, so if you have someone who's unskilled or who is not a qualified medical professional, this could be potentially dangerous and deadly. To, to a woman. So to an extent, these laws do function to protect, uh, protect women because they're trying to keep the wrong people from performing these procedures.
So Dr. Horatio Storer, he would become the preeminent face of the anti-abortion movement in the 19th century. And he believed that medical men were the guardians of women and children. He is the quintessential example of an American Medical Association member of the 19th century. He is from New England, he went to Harvard, um, and he was really religious. He was a member of one of these first generations of uh, you know, gynecologists uh, who are basically moving into this brand new field. He is a contemporary of people like J. Marion Sims, who we read, up, who we read about in Medical Bondage. But he's most well known for his efforts to eradicate the practice of abortion. He and his contemporaries are actually responsible for making abortion a moral issue for the first time. That previously, no one was really interested or invested in the moral implications of abortion. No one talked about abortion in a moral way before, at least not in relation to it being a potential person. But he and others like him began to refer to abortion as infanticide or in antenatal infanticide, pre, you know, prenatal infanticide, um, or even murder. And they emphasized their own education and specialization to basically argue that they were the people who were best in a position to lobby the government to basically eradicate this practice. Now, we talked previously about um, the, the development of the medical field and how it worked in uh, tandem with basically delegitimizing midwives and other quack doctors. This is part of that as well because it's usually midwives um, and, and physicians of color uh, who were most likely to perform abortions. So it's not just about this moral thing, it's also about suggesting that these other people should not be qualified to practice medicine. We are. We, American Medical Association, AMA members, are. So basically, as a result of this campaign, good, reputable doctors did not perform abortions unless it was absolutely necessary to protect the life of a woman. Other than that, uh, abortions were immoral because fetuses were potential persons. And eventually, by 1880, all states have laws against abortion. No questions? Yeah, Jillian. Before the moral element was added, what was the reasons that they had against abortion? It was more about, um, you know, sex being for procreation um, and that it should be within the confines of marriage. Um, so it was less about the fact that this was a person and more about, well, this meant that you were having, um, you know, immoral sex practices. Mark? Was the AMA, were they actually backed by the government, or were they just a bunch of doctors who said, hey, look, we're the authority now? It's a bunch of physicians who organize themselves and say, you know, we are creating standards. We are, um, it's not backed by the government. Rather, they kind of form their own lobbying group to say, we are going to define the standards of professional medicine, and we are, um, we are going to kind of be gatekeepers for this practice, to make sure that, you know, everyone meets these standards, that we have a mainline, you know, position on things, and we, they, they basically become a lobbying group after that. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So you have uh, Dr. Storer and other people who are putting forth this kind of moral and educational campaign, but another thing that's adding fuel uh, to this movement to get rid of abortion was the proliferation of abortion stories in the press. Now, most women who acquire abortions in the late 19th and early 20th century, they do so quietly using referrals from friends, sisters, coworkers, maybe even trusted physicians. And many of these women secretly have successful abortions, and we don't know anything about them. But these aren't the women who become topics of conversation in popular culture that you have this sensationalism of publicized abortion-related deaths that provides fodder for reformers, for physicians, and other moralists who believe that legalized abortion is gradually going to erode America's moral fabric. And in typical yellow journalism fashion, newspapers of the 19th and early 20th century broadcasted story after story of young, pretty girls who were dying as a result of illegal abortions. 
Now, undercover reporters uh, at one time for the New York Times actually ended up releasing a 25-part expose called Infanticide to basically talk about the dangers of illegal abortion and its villainous providers in New York City. So in this uh, investigation, there were two journalists who went undercover. Uh, they were pretending to be a couple. And then in this you know, long form expose, they transported readers of their newspaper to the abortion underworld, and they exposed physicians, midwives, and police officers who were basically receiving bribes or who were somehow involved with this trade. And so using abortion stories as kind of seedy human interest stories helped the newspapers to profit uh, because you could spread these stories out for days at a time. You can give a little bit one day and then just drag the story out for a week or two weeks if you wanted. Now, if you recall, a couple weeks ago, we saw a short clip from the 1934 film Road to Ruin. Uh, if you remember, um, they were having a party and then Eve and Anne were taken away by um, a female police officer and then they were medically inspected and then Eve had syphilis and then she reforms and changes her life and then Anne finds out she's pregnant. And so when I turned off the clip, I told you, you know, Anne's boyfriend tells her he's not going to marry her and he takes her to have an illegal abortion and she dies. That's the same kind of thing, except that was a film example that you have these stories of sex and of jilted lovers, uh, cover-ups and death, and it's really titillating for whoever's reading or watching them. But it's important to note that they also fit within this larger framework. It's not just about stopping abortion. It's also fitting within other attempts to regulate sexuality, to make sure that sexuality was conforming with heterosexual normative practices, rep repressing homosexuality, preventing abortion, policing prostitution, and preventing the dissemination of other obscene material. It's making sure that women's sexuality fits within a certain framework um, and that that framework is marital reproductive sex. Everyone else should be shamed. So these women who die from these procedures, they can't conceal their identity or their practices anymore. They kind of serve as cautionary tales for everyone else. Questions? Okay. But even though there is this policing, abortions don't disappear. And by the 1920s, the campaign, the, the AMA campaign against abortion, had created a more hostile environment for women who were seeking these procedures. Women may have felt harassed by their physicians. Their physicians might have given them sermons. And some women might have felt guilty to go speak to their doctor about this. And it's also harder to get an abortion if you know, the physicians are cracking down on other providers uh, through their internal regulation, but even if law enforcement is also helping with that as well. Abort abortion is a legally ambiguous procedure in the United States. I mentioned that by 1880, all states have laws against it, but it's important to note that the procedure is not banned in and of itself. Rather, the circumstances around abortion indicate whether the procedure is legal or illegal. So this means that an abortion could be legal for one woman and illegal for another, or even legal for one woman's pregnancy and then illegal for her next pregnancy in the same woman. This is because every state with an abortion statute has a clause that provides exceptions for when a woman's life is in danger. That if a woman is likely going to die from this pregnancy, then the physician has the right and has the authority to perform an abortion in that instance. But there are no clear criteria to assess whether or not a woman's life is at risk. So there's no kind of checklist to determine what actually constitutes a, a risk to a woman's life. Now, since physicians typically practiced independently, it was acceptable for them to come to their own conclusions and assess whether or not they believed an abortion was medically necessary. And this is considered a legal abortion. If a physician thinks that their patient has a condition that will threaten her life with this pregnancy, 
he or she can just schedule the procedure and that's it. But if physicians are hardline AME members, like Horatio Storer, they may be less inclined to provide the procedure. Yeah, Bianca. What if they, what if they like, went to another state? Were they able to get an abortion and get a different doctor's opinion? So the states vary in every single state. And they may not even have to go to another state. Um, they can maybe find another physician who they can convince that they should have a legal abortion. And that's a really interesting and, and good point that Bianca just brought up. Because by the 1950s and 60s, and we'll get there in a, in a second, this legal distinction becomes incredibly amorphous. That by the time we get to the 1950s and 60s, we have an abuse of this trust uh, that pr uh, professional AMA members have kind of given individual physicians that leads to that decision being removed from the individual physician and placed in the hands of a committee. So it's no longer your individual physician who says, yep, I think that this is necessary. Uh, it's now three to five physicians who you've never met who determine whether or not they think you should have an abortion or not. We'll get there in a little bit though. But what's interesting also is that for some women, this creates a space for negotiation, right? If I want this physician to continue working for me and my family, you'll find a reason to justify this abortion, right? Okay, so it's legally amorphous. Eventually, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, um, it, it goes out of the physician's hands. So as professional medicine strictly circumscribes what constitutes legal abortions, um, in the 1920s, it's only an exception for life. It is only an exception for a woman's life being in danger. So as this is a pretty hardline stance, there are other people who take advantage of this. Um, you get the emergence of the abortion specialist in the 1930s, and the abortion specialist is strictly performing illegal abortions. But they're taking advantage of new technologies, perhaps maybe even antibiotics, and they are trying to kind of fill this market niche for them. So we're going to talk about one of these abortion specialists in California. And it's not just one, it's like 30 of them. In 1934, Reginald Rankin approached Dr. George Watts, and he proposed to him an idea for an organized criminal abortion syndicate that would span the entire West Coast, from Seattle to the U.S.-Mexico border. And Watts, he approached, or Rankin approached Watts specifically because Watts was an abortion specialist. He had developed this new method for performing an abortion called the vacuum aspiration technique, which sounds incredibly scary, um, but it meant that his abortions were safe. He was able to practice for 40 years, and he stayed under the radar. It reduced the risk of sepsis and infection because it basically uh, removed all fetal tissue from the uterus, and that's why his, his method worked. So Rankin approached Watts. Watts came on board, and between 1934 and 1936, Rankin brought in several other abortion specialists and even some physicians. He created new offices, and by 1936, he had over 30 abortion specialists working for him. To most women who sought the services of Rankin or any of the physicians working for him. Rankin himself was not an abortionist or a specialist. He was the, um, the genius or the master behind, uh, mastermind behind all of this. Um, but if any woman went to one of their clinics, it would seem just like any other visit to another medical clinic, except um, a woman might be blindfolded. She might not see the person who's providing the procedure to her. Um, or she might have several doctors in the room with her at a time so that she can not actually identify which one performed the procedure. But once a woman arrived for treatment, she would tell the nurse or the receptionist how far along with her pregnancy, and that would actually determine the cost. So the further along she was, the more it would cost. Now, ideally, they'd like to charge between $30 and $50 for a procedure. 
And this was only in the first six to eight weeks. Um, if you were to put that into modern values, um, the, the government's inflation calculator only goes up to 2019 right now. Um, but if you were put to put $35 to $50 um, in 2019 values, that would be between $660 and $950. Now, again, this is only if she's in her first six to eight weeks. If she was 12 weeks along, then the clinic should charge between $50 to $75, maybe even $100. And beyond 12 weeks, the clinic was supposed to collect as much money as possible, $200, $250, or even $300. And I've put some of those values here for you. So $250 would be about $4,700 today. Now, once the staff had collected forms and fees, they would escort the patient to the operating room, and then she would have her procedure. This is actually one of the um, physicians from this rink. Uh, that's Paul de Gaston. If you want to know more about it, read my book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Andrea. Yes, it is illegal. And so was it mostly for wealthy people? Um, you, so if we're looking at like the values, for example, um, $660, it's obviously a lot of money, right? If we're looking at the modern day equivalents of that. Um, you get a lot of young working women who, who get these procedures. So maybe they've saved some money, maybe they've... Um, taken a loan or borrowed some money from friends. We do see later that some women actually like turned in their fur coats or engagement rings uh, instead because they might have been insured and they could say someone stole it or I lost it. And then they can kind of use those valuable possessions as a way to cover this cost. Um, I don't cover this in the lecture, but they were actually so well organized, they created their own credit arm. So they helped to finance women who couldn't afford it up front. They charged more for it, um, but it, it created a payment plan for some of these women who couldn't pay for it up front. Yeah, so they were very innovative. Yeah. <laughs> this ring, um, they're in operation for a few years. After some tips, there's a series of raids, and it's eventually brought down by a joint task force of the LAPD the San Francisco Police Department, and the Alameda County Sheriffs. And all of the members of the ring were arrested. It was incredibly profitable, though. I don't think I can stress that enough. Uh, if we're just looking at their downtown Los Angeles office, they netted the equivalent of about $85,000 per month. That's after all of their fees, commissions, everything. That is their profit, $85,000 per month, just from their downtown LA office. They also had offices in San Diego, Long Beach, Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland, and more. So they're not, doing, they're not doing too bad. The district attorney, when they're doing the raids, uh, they find a wealth of paperwork and documentation. They found the names of patients and coerced them to testify on the stand. So this actually results in guilty verdicts for most of the conspirators. And in many respects, this Pacific Coast abortion ring, their success was namely because they were able to provide safe, illegal abortions. It also contributed to their demise. That in contrast to almost every other prosecution, every other prosecuted case before this, they didn't have any fatalities. No woman died in one of their clinics. They did not lose a single woman. And even though women were dying from illegal abortions elsewhere, they were not receiving their abortions from this clinic or any of their clinics. So this is really the antithesis of those abortion stories in the newspapers from the 1920s. That for the first time, it appears that illegal abortions could be safe. That you might not end up in one of these newspaper stories about a young, dead, pretty girl. Questions so far? Yeah. Because those women are, you know, are going to these illegal clinics, were they also facing any consequences as well? That's a good question. So technically, they could be charged. But they, uh, the district attorney often said, I won't charge you if you testify against them. So they were coerced. They were encouraged or urged 
Um, they were basically told they could avoid criminal penalties if they were open and vocal and, and told about the procedure. This is Reginald Rankin, and that's his mugshot. Before the Rankin case, before people of the state of California versus Reginald Rankin, successful abortions um, were basically invisible from the wider public. But with scores of living witnesses, there's a mountain of evidence against these people. And so what this case does, I argue, is that it opens for stricter enforcement of the abortion statutes in California. Fewer physicians begin to risk performing the procedure unless they're sure their patient has a clear justifiable reason. Furthermore, on top of this, in the 1930s, we do begin to see more labor, delivery, and other services like this moving into the hospital and abortions, legal abortions as well. So if legal abortions are moving into hospitals, um, whereas before they might have been performed in doctor's offices, then the need for some of these clinics or even their visibility comes under greater scrutiny. So now there is effectively a lower burden of proof that is necessary to bring an illegal abortionist to prison. If, e if legal abortions are taking place in hospitals, then clinics don't need speculums. They don't need operating tables. They don't need any of those things because abortions, legal abortions, should be taking place in a hospital. And if women are surviving their illegal abortions because of antibiotics and sterilized equipment, then they could be coerced into testifying against their abortionist. And in court, when these women are, are forced to testify, um, the attorneys don't really make any efforts to try to understand why these women wanted to obtain these procedures. Most of the time they just asked, did you have an illness or defect that would make you incapable of carrying this pregnancy to term? And to this, most women usually responded, no, they technically didn't have a disease or defect. They were maybe tired or they previously had a difficult pregnancy or they weren't ready for another child. And so few of these women were given the opportunities to speak for themselves or to explain themselves outside of the narrative that the DA was trying to lean them towards. Um, some women do try to speak for themselves and say that they were appreciative of Rankin and some of the other doctors, but that was it. Now, under examination in court, these women were often forced to divulge very intimate details of their private lives, their sex lives, the procedures, and even their bodies. Prosecutors asked them about what positions they assumed on the table, whether they were naked, whether they were draped, if they felt the speculums being inserted into them. So when Grace Peterson, for example, took the stand to talk about her abortion, she started crying and she said, I told you I had it done, isn't that enough? You also have this movement towards surveillance. And that's what these two pictures are actually showing. So these are women who are going in and out of court to testify against their abortionists. They're trying to hide their face. And these are actually two different surveillance operations. So this is actually in Redlands. And then this is in LA. So you have police officers parked across the street in cars, taking pictures and watching the office of a presumed abortionist. And they're just keeping track of who goes in, who comes out, how they assess their condition to be as they enter and exit. Um, so you see actually a woman in this one, and they're just watching in that one. So for some of these women, instead of tolerating an invasive line of questioning after probably what was already an invasive abortion, um, other women kind of see this and they begin to look for other options. How can they escape this torment and shame that is being brought on by a criminal trial, a public criminal trial? So what are the options for these women then after that? You can try to acquire a legal abortion in a more strict environment, or you can continue to try to take your chances with an illegal provider. Questions? I'm just curious, so during this time, what was the reason behind the abortion being uh, illegal? Was it, did it have anything to do with uh, 
past eugenics movement? That's a really great point, and we'll t mention the eugenics movement in a couple slides, but I see that as more, um, I frame it, I guess, in a different way in the, in the next couple slides. So it could be about ensuring that certain people are continuing to reproduce at a higher level. Um, I'm sure that, is, that sentiment is there. Um, it could also just be concerns about morality, right? That um, they think it's an immoral thing to do because now the AMA has been so successful in saying that these are babies um, that, and that these are bad women, right? And especially if they're married women and they're trying to abort their pregnancies, then, you know, they're, they're failing at what is supposed to define a proper woman's role. That, um, and, and this is something that, that I don't talk about now, but uh, about 80% of, of all the women in, in the period of study that I look at in Los Angeles County, about 80% of them were married women. Um, so we are primarily looking at women who are considered deviant because of their choice to have an abortion, even though they should kind of fit under this umbrella of you know, normative sexuality. So this is deviant behavior for these women. Um, so I, I would stress that it's ideologies about gender and reproduction that are important. Um, it's obviously less about safety in some instances, um, and, and especially as you have sterilization of instruments and antibiotics that become available widely in the 1940s. Um, so I think gender ideologies are, play really a, a prominent role. Okay to have an abortion? Husbands were, it's a patchwork for that. In some instances, husbands are brought to, try, brought to court to testify as well. Um, in the examples of like courtroom testimony that I've looked at, it's one of two things. Either the husband knew and he was aware and he like drove her there um, personally, or the husband's like, I don't know, she was just, I thought she was going to the market and I didn't see her for hours, you know? So it's, the husbands are either part of it and part of the decision-making process, or they're oblivious. And that's really like the only two extremes that I found in the, the court records that I looked at. That it was either like a couple's decision to do this, that maybe the husband wasn't there, but he was consulted, um, and you know, husbands for the 80% of them. Um, or, you know, I don't know what she was doing, I just thought she was a little sick. Yeah. Other questions? So moving into like the 1940s and 1950s and maybe the 1960s. And going back to these exceptions that remain for maternal life. Now, though these exceptions for maternal life existed, advances in medical technology had made it exceedingly rare to find an illness in a disease or a disease in a pregnant woman that would prevent her from carrying a pregnancy to term. Now, there is a little bit of, of global context as well. In 1938, there is an English case, Rex v. Bourne. We're not going to talk about it. Um, but this drew global attention from the entire medical community. Um, publications in American medical journals were reporting on this case just about every, epi uh, every issue. And what the results from that case were, were they basically opened the door to therapeutic exceptions when the health of a woman was at risk. So it no longer had to be her life. She didn't have to be on death's door in order for an abortion to be legal. But rather, they could look at her health writ large, whether that was mental health, physical health, not necessarily something that was going to manifest in her death. So in that context, this therapeutic designation that had already existed becomes a little bit more amorphous in the 1940s. That it becomes this valuable loophole for women who are seeking legal abortions. These therapeutic abortions required a private physician with hospital privileges, and it was a hospital procedure that often was coupled with a hospital stay. So therapeutic abortions then become a class issue, Be become a race issue that this effectively precludes all physicians of color 
because most physicians of color do not have hospital privileges unless it's, it's an open hospital, unless it's an interracial hospital. So private hospitals, overwhelmingly, um, a lot of those have restrictions on physicians of color. This also means, right, because of cost, because of the fact that this is a hospital stay and a private physician, this means that the most typical recipients of these were native-born white women of means, that they have some ability to uh, be able to afford this procedure and all of the care that went with it. And these women have some space to negotiate with their physicians. Once this moves from life to health, it becomes much more open to interpretation. At one point, excessive vomiting is considered an appropriate reason for a therapeutic abortion or um, tiredness or suicidal concerns, right? It becomes this, this bigger animal that people can kind of wrestle with. By the 1950s, and especially by the 1960s, this flexibility is considered abuse. Exploitation of this loophole leads to the control of these decisions to hospital therapeutic abortion committees. So if a woman in the 50s and 60s wanted a legal abortion, a therapeutic abortion, then she would go to her regular physician and then her physician would have to present her case before this committee, and then that committee would deliberate and return a decision. So under this new regime, the rate of therapeutic abortion declines dramatically. County and state officials in California recorded the numbers of, abortions that were, uh, of abortion cases that were brought before their committee. They recorded the number of, of cases that they approved, they kept track of all of these numbers, and they were particularly strict in their interpretations of what they thought constituted an acceptable reason for a therapeutic abortion. Dr. Edmund Overstreet, he was an OBGYN and professor of gynecology at the UC San Francisco uh, Medical Center, and he stated that even though the number of applications for therapeutic abortions had increased tenfold, they had a strict limit of five abortions a week. It didn't matter how many people were applying, they only performed five abortions a week. There were things that do begin to push back against some of these blanket restrictions, though. Questions? One of these things that begins to push for better abortion legislation is the thalidomide disaster. And the thalidomide disaster is often described as one of the darkest episodes in pharmaceutical history. Thalidomide was developed in the 1950s by a West German pharmaceutical company. It was an anti-convulsive drug, and it made people feel sleepy and relaxed. During the patenting and testing of this drug, no one looked at the potential side effects on pregnant women, uh, and instead they just said it was safe, safe for anyone, even during pregnancy. The reason they said it was safe was that they could not find a lethal dose. They couldn't find a dose of thalidomide so high that it even killed a rat. Um, so they just assumed that that meant it was safe. This drug was licensed in 1956 for prescription and over-the-counter sale in Germany and through other parts of Europe. And uh, doctors later found out that it helped some of their patients reduce morning sickness, so it actually became a very popular drug among pregnant women. But doctors in Germany and in other parts of Europe began to notice an increase in children that were born with birth defects. And it was not until 1961 that they recognized that the link was thalidomide. Now, I'm referencing information for the, uh, like the National Medical Library and the Center for Biotechnical Information. Um, so I'm going to explain in layman's terms, as best as I can, what the, the effects are of this drug. So thalidomide interferes with fetal development, especially when it's taken in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. And this is usually when pregnant women experience morning sickness, okay? Thalidomide, thalidomide interferes with angiogenesis or the development of new blood vessels. And in the first eight weeks of pregnancy is when things like limbs are beginning to develop. 
So the blood vessels that are in these, uh, in these limbs are relatively new, and they are more susceptible to teratogenesis, which is toxicity of, of, of areas that can relate to structural and functional defects. The specific type of teratogenesis associated with thalidomide is phocomelia, in which you have uh, a congenital malformation where the hands and feet are attached to shorter limbs. Okay. So globally, about 10,000 children are born with thalidomide-related disabilities, and by 1962, this drug was banned. Now, the U.S. doesn't see very much of this at all. Um, the, the drug examiner who was in charge of the FDA, a woman by the name of Frances Kelsey, rejected uh, their application for going onto the American market. Uh, she, la she believed that their test lacked sufficient evidence of its safety, so she actually prevented the drug. Um, so we can thank her for that. Um, there are still American women who do get their hands on this drug, but it was never legally on the American market, so we don't see it to the extent that some of these European nations do see it. Questions? Now, what we do see in the U.S., though, is the rubella or German measles outbreak. By the middle of the 1960s, about 20,000 babies were born with congenital rubella syndrome. Now, congenital rubella syndrome is when, when babies are born with it, but rubella or German measles in a, an adult itself has very minimal effects that at most it might be a rash, um, and some people exhibit no symptoms at all. But if a woman is pregnant when she has rubella, then it manifests into really grave effects on the fetus, that these um, defects or, or, or anomalies can include deafness, blindness, heart disease, neuromuscular tightness, uh, intellectual disabilities, and more. And so this does happen in the United States, and we do see this in greater numbers in the United States. The vaccine for this wasn't developed until about 1970. So as physicians and scientists are scrambling to try to figure out what to do, a lot of physicians are encouraging women who are exposed to rubella, pregnant women who are exposed to rubella, to get an abortion, which is pushing on the limits that most states have for legal abortion because the disease itself does not affect the life of the woman, or even her health, except just the health of her fetus. So the thalidomide tragedy and the German measles outbreak, they do manifest into calls for the relaxation of existing abortion laws in the United States and in Europe. One of the most visible cases regarding abortion and these trage tragedies involves this woman who is named Sherry Chesson. She is often referred to as Sherry Finkbein. Uh, that was her husband's last name, but I remember hearing an oral history with her, and she said she was so mad people called her Sherry Finkbein because she didn't use Finkbein, she used Chesson. Um, so I immediately changed all my notes um, because she preferred Chesson. She was the host of a public access TV show called The Romper Room. And it was, she was a teacher in this TV show, and there were little, you know, first grade kindergarten kids, and, you know, they did the Pledge of Allegiance, they played little games, and in the TV show, she's just like their teacher. Now, in 1962, she sought a legal abortion in a hospital because she had taken thalidomide. Her husband was a pilot and had found thalidomide when he was... Uh, in Europe, sorry, he wasn't a pilot, he was um, in the military, and then he, when he was in Europe, he had gotten his hold, a hold of thalidomide, and he gave it to his wife um, at some point during her pregnancy. And so she was concerned, she was aware of what was going on, she was concerned that her child would be deformed. So she scheduled this abortion, but she was also concerned about other women. If she was able to get a hold of this drug, she knew there were probably other women in America who had gotten a hold of it, too. So she spoke to the press on the condition of anonymity, and she wanted to make the dangers of thalidomide known to American women. But somehow, someone uh, got a hold of the hospital, found out about her procedure, and her, her hospital physician basically contacted her to let her know that the abortion was canceled. 
And this story became a sensation. She soon realized she had no prospect of getting a legal abortion in her state of Arizona. So she was able to fly to Sweden, where abortion was legal, and she had the procedure there. After the abortion was completed, they did verify that the fetus had been affected by the thalidomide. It only had one arm and it had no legs. When she returned, she lost her job at the romper room. The mother of five was no longer thought to be safe around children. And her family received death threats. People were threatening her children who were alive. They even put death threats on their dog. Like, so this was something that actually generated a lot of, of public attention. But there were other people who said, we need common sense abortion legislation. We can't just have a blanket ban. We need to take some of these other things into consideration as well. Now, Sherry Chesson and her husband, they weren't the wealthiest people, but they did have connections, and that's how they were able to get um, this, this abortion in Sweden. Um, had Sherry Chesson not talked to the, uh, to the press, her abortion likely would have been carried out without a problem, legally, in this Arizona hospital. But if we're looking at the experiences of other women, and especially looking at poor women and women of color, if these women do not have a physician acting as their advocate, then they are perhaps more at risk. If we're looking at the 30s, 40s, and, and through the 60s, looking at things like the war on poverty, um, if these women had a condition that permitted a therapeutic abortion, they were likely to be sterilized as well. We'll talk more about sterilization in the 60s and 70s when we look at uh, the right to parent. Um, but just understand that this is going on in the background as well that if a woman's heredity or genetics dictate an abortion for this unborn child, then why not prevent future children from being born in the first place if the genetics are what's the problem? So if a woman wants an abortion but doesn't want to risk her odds with a committee, or if she doesn't have a condition, or if she maybe wants children in the future, then her odds are still likely to be in the hands of an illegal abortionist. That's where her best odds are for getting an illegal abortion. And for many California women after 1953, that illegal provider is more and more likely to be across the border in Mexico. Now, women of means had been traveling for abortions for years, going to places like Mexico City, Japan, and Sweden, uh, where these other laws were more relaxed. Now, again, that precludes a lot of other women. You need to be able to afford a, a plane ticket. You need to be able to afford a, a week stay and all of these other things. But an important transformation takes place in California's in the 20th century with suburbanization, uh, with highway infrastructure and development. The automobile becomes a really important facet of California life. And more Americans in the 20th century, more Californians in the 20th century, begin to travel and use their car as a means through which they can go to places like Mexico to maybe have uh, some fun, to maybe engage in uh, drinking in Prohibition era America, or maybe just to engage in other behavior that is somehow considered you know, improper in American society. And so as these inroads and, and travel routes develop, abortionists take to this mobility as well. They're using freeways, roads, and personal vehicles, and they're growing across the border, too. Questions so far? Okay. So let's go back to Reginald Rankin, because we're not done with him yet. After he serves time in San Quentin, he tries to create a new abortion ring in Reno, Nevada, and then he goes to prison for that one, too. Um, and then he eventually makes his way back to California, and he meets up with Dr. Royal Buffum, who's pictured here. They had initially met in the 1930s. Rankin actually tried to get Buffum to join the Pacific Coast abortion ring, but Buffum refused. And it's unclear how they became reacquainted, uh, but they do become reacquainted sometime after 1950. And together, these two men decided to create a new abortion business. They opened up an office in Long Beach, California, and they would help make arrangements for women who were seeking abortions. Now, once a woman approached them, they would take their phone number, um, they would call them, and then they would 
make a, a designated meeting place where they would meet up. From that designated meeting place, either Buffum or Rankin would transport the women in a station wagon to Tijuana, Mexico, where another man performed the procedure. After the procedure, the women were driven back. They all went their separate ways. Now, in the specific case that brought about their arrest, three of the four women they transported required hospitalization after their procedures. The men were initially convicted and found guilty of violating California's abortion law. But things got really interesting upon appeal because this involved a conspiracy to commit a crime in another place. The crime did not take place in California. So you can't assume the California Supreme Court state that the California state legislator attempted to regulate behavior that took place outside of the geographic bounds of the state. So the court effectively recognized the limits of its power and their conviction was overturned. So this decision basically opens the floodgate of American abortion tourism to nearby border cities. That because they won their appeal, they effectively single-handedly became responsible for the develop development of this abortion tourism industry in the 1950s and 60s. Particularly in the 60s in Tijuana and Ensenada, um, you have American women's demands that are basically creating an opportunity for this thriving black market in Mexican border cities. Tijuana and some of these other places, they're cheaper than legal but maybe cost prohibitive abortions in the US um, and maybe even illegal abortions in the US. And you don't need a plane ticket. You don't need to stay for a week. If you're a California woman using our highways and automobiles, you can take care of an abortion within the matter of a day trip. So Mexican abortions effectively enter the American cultural mainstream. They're even the basis of the storyline of the author poet Richard Brodigan's uh, Abortion and Historical Romance, 1966. Um, but women up and down the state begin to take advantage of this opportunity now. There are instances where Women, college students in Berkeley charter a bus and they get a group of women to basically go to the border uh, to have their abortions over the course of a weekend. You have other women who meet people in parking lots and are transported. And you have other women who just simply rent a car and go over the border by themselves and take care of this. So this decision creates this legal void and law enforcement officials were trying desperately to fill it. At one point, the San Diego District Attorney Don Keller said that law enforcement officials recognized that this case basically prohibited prosecution of any case, even if they made arrangements in California and even paid for it in California. He said, it appears as long as the Buffum case stands, the wholesale abortion mills will continue to operate in Mexico. That's where they made all the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And then they would travel with the females to Mexico and perform the procedures. Yep. And that's how they got away with it. Yep. Because so, the actual abortion took place outside of California. Wow. And this was some like 20 years later after Rinkin had been found guilty. Yeah. So the Buffum case is 1953. And then the um, people of the state of California, that was in the 30s. Yeah. So he, he did time for that. And then he did some time in Nevada because he tried to do it. We're skipping over that. Um, but then he, he goes back to the abortion business in California in the 50s. Yeah. He's a really interesting character that we can't spend too much time on. But. Other questions? So um, I'm just trying to understand, like, why was he so adamant about, like, is it just for the money? For, for Rankin, like, why does he keep going back to abortion? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he, he was always looking for a get-rich-quick scheme, from what I've seen. Um, I don't know whether he was interested in women's rights or he was simply motivated by profit. Um, before this, he did some nefarious tax dealings and real estate and property dealings um, before. Um, and then I'm not sure whether he realized that abortion was really lucrative and that this might be the better option. Um, 
But he obviously made very good connections in the 30s that he decides to spend basically the rest of his life. Um, he dies around 1955. Uh, he spends basically the rest of his life trying to figure out abortion businesses. Um, I had a very brief exchange with his daughter at one point, and she said um, he was a man ahead of his time. And so I don't know if she has this very kind of complicated feeling about him. Um, so I choose maybe not to look at the moral aspect that, you know, was he a good guy or a bad guy? Uh, instead, I say, you know, he was an astute businessman at his prime, and he did provide countless women with safe procedures. And how I feel about his motivations, I suppose, is irrelevant to what actually happened from that. Yeah. Other questions? So after the Buffum case, legislators in California did try to close this loophole. Uh, they did pass other legislation, but it, it didn't do anything to stop what had already been begun uh, in California and in these Mexican border towns. And as concerns about Tijuana abortions grow, and I, and I say Tijuana abortions just kind of as a blanket term, this is often the term that is used to define abortions that take place in Mexican border towns, regardless of what city they actually take place in. Um, but as these concerns about Tijuana abortions grow, um, the border also becomes more visible to Americans in the 1950s and 60s through increased regulation, specifically um, Senate Committees on Vice, Operation Wetback. Uh, you have drug smuggling and crime that were hotly debated in public. And in the context of the Cold War period, a lot of Americans feel that border towns were particularly susceptible to um, you know, vice or, or evil or corruption. Um, or danger. So it's also important to note, I mean, I've been kind of like, oh, you know, Rankin, none of the people died. It is important to know that as this abortion industry on the border grows, there are more opportunities for unskilled providers to offer their services. That sometimes you do have desperate women who cross the border and they simply accept the services of the first person that they find. They don't research and do, uh, they don't search for the most qualified person. They just take the first abortion that they have. So you do have scores of unqualified abortionists who are able to operate, and they are botching these procedures. Now, it's also important to note that just because an abortion is botched does not mean that it's deadly or fatal. It could also just mean that women aren't getting hygienic procedures, that their instruments aren't being properly sterilized, they're not getting pain relievers, they aren't getting antibiotics. And so for some of these women who have these unhygienic procedures, when they return to the United States, they often have to go to an American emergency room to either help themselves to complete the abortion. Sometimes the abortions aren't, are only partial abortions in the border, or to even save their life. So as these county hospitals, in the Los Angeles County Hospital especially, as they are treating these women, they're basically performing dilations and curettments to complete these procedures that had been botched in Mexico. So Tijuana abortions come to be remembered as particularly crude. Um, and when Dr. Leon Bellis, our last physician in our long line of physicians, when he referred a woman to an abortionist, um, he did so because he feared she would turn to butchery in Tijuana. I would imagine. Um, for some women, um, and especially if they had some kind of infection, in the most grave instances, you know, organs are taken out to stop an infection or a spread of some kind of, um, you know, bacteria. Um, so there are those instances. Or if someone slipped and an instrument punctured a uterus, th that happened as well. So there are instances when that does happen. Um, I don't have, and, and that's not because they don't exist, but I just don't have as many examples off the top of my head that I know about that. But they do happen. In 1966, Dr. Leon Bellis was found guilty of abortion and conspiracy to commit abortion. 
he appealed. Uh, he defended his action, claiming, again, that he feared that his patient re would resort to butchery in Tijuana. And rather than see her mutilated in the hands of a greedy opportunist, he referred her um, to an illegal abortionist for the procedure. He referred her to an illegal abortionist that he trusted uh, for this procedure. He recognized her desperation. The Court of Appeals affirmed the lower court's decision in 1967, so he ends up taking his case to the California Supreme Court, where it's decided in 1969. And in his appeal at the California uh, Supreme Court, he is challenging the constitutionality of California's abortion law. The potential butchery that he feared, he believed was sufficient to say that her life was in danger. And according to court records, Dr. Bellis claimed he was very familiar with the abortion business in Tijuana, and he knew that when women went to Tijuana for abortions, they were taking their lives in their own hands. And in fact, just weeks after the abortion of the client he referred, there was a wife of a Woodland Hills dentist who died from an illegal abortion in Mexico, even though it was a physician in Mexico who had performed the procedure. So specifically, Dr. Bellis is concerned that his patient was going to seek an abortion in Tijuana under substandard medical conditions. And so the basis of his concerns relied on several assertions, that illegal abortions were dangerous, that Mexican border towns offered American women abortions, and that illegal abortions in Mexico were more dangerous or were worse than illegal or, or any abortions in the United States. So when this case was before the California Supreme Court, they debated tirelessly over some of the legal questions that were put forth. Courts had already rejected the interpretation of abortion laws that required certainty or immediacy of death. Two prior cases in California had already established that requiring certainty of death would abridge a woman's constitutional rights, specifically her right to privacy and her right to life. Furthermore, the court did seem to recognize that abortion laws didn't reduce the number of abortions, they just reduced the number of safe abortions that took place. And if we look at contemporary evidence from 1969, hygienic abortions that were performed orally in pregnancy resulted in minimal risk to women, while illegal abortions were the greatest cause of maternal death in California. While not all illegal abortions ended in death, the rate of infection from illegal abortions was also significantly higher than that of legal abortions. And in an amicus brief submitted to the court on behalf of Dr. Bellis from 178 deans of medical schools in California and the rest of the country, they said that the unfortunate reality was that this statute that had been designed in 1850 to protect women had in modern times become a scourge. So the California Supreme Court ultimately reversed Dr. Bellis's conviction and stated that California's abortion law was unreasonably vague and therefore void. So California ended up decriminalizing abortion shortly before other states explicitly legalized it. While other states would have followed whether or not California was the first, California's ruling in Bellis basically represents the end of this era of criminalization. In the context of the civil rights movement and shifting public sentiment on the issue of abortion, the California Supreme Court abandoned its efforts to continue criminalizing this procedure. And by 1970, a number of states had begun to push for repeals of their existing abortion laws and several legalized abortion on demand, including Hawaii, Alaska, New York, and Washington. But this had not yet been decided at the federal level. Questions? So California decriminalizes in 1969. Yes, it was based on the. So he was Bellis. acquitted. He was a yes, okay. or his conviction was overturned. Yes. Okay. Other questions? So in 1969, uh, Norma McCorvey discovered that she was pregnant, uh, and in order to secure a legal abortion in Texas, where she lived, she claimed that the pregnancy was the result of a rape. However, since there were no police reports documenting the rape, she was unable to secure a legal abortion. So in 
So she attempted to acquire an illegal abortion, but the day she was supposed to go in, she found out that the police had already shut down the clinic. So out of options, she reached out to recent law school graduates, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington. McCorvey, who is pictured on the left, uh, she took the alias Jane Roe, and this photo is, is later, this is several years after the decision. Uh, she took the alias Jane Roe, and the two young attorneys argued that the Texas law violated her constitutional rights. Now, Roe claimed that her life was not in danger, which was another option. It was another requirement for legal abortions in Texas, um, and that she couldn't afford to leave the state. But she had a right to be able to have an abortion under safe clinical conditions. So like the argument in Bellis, Roe and her attorneys claimed that the Texas abortion statute was unconstitutionally vague and that it violated several of her uh, rights, including her first, fourth, fifth, and ninth, and 14th Amendment rights. In the end of this case, we're skipping over a few things, but in the end, the court does agree to an imperfect trimester system delineating when abortion is legal or illegal. According to the Supreme Court justices, since the medical community argued that fetuses could be viable after six months, then the state had the right or the interest to protect fetal life after that point, of course, providing an exception for maternal life. But before viability, before six months, the court doesn't really have enough, or sorry, the state doesn't really have enough of a conflicting interest in the fetus or the embryo to stop a woman from getting an abortion. And so it is with Roe v. Wade, which is cited in 1973, that abortions become legal and protected in the United States. Now, there have been challenges to Roe, um, basically almost immediately. Since Roe, since the Roe decision, the U.S. Supreme Court has affirmed the right to an abortion. They have also stated that states cannot ban abortions outright before viability, and that any restrictions a state puts in place must contain exceptions to protect a woman's life. And opposition to Roe began almost immediately once the court was decided, once the case was decided, but it was relatively quiet. In 1977, the Hyde Amendment was passed, and it essentially banned the use of federal dollars for abortion coverage for women who are on Medicaid. And Rosie Jimenez, who is pictured here, is often cited as the first victim of the Hyde Amendment. It was passed in September of 1976. It went into effect in August of 77. She was 27 years old in 1977. She was a student. Uh, she was trying to become a teacher so that she could have a better life for herself and for her daughter. Abortion was legal where she lived, but it was costly. She had approached one physician about a legal abortion, and she was informed that it would cost about $400. She relied on welfare, and a legal abortion was cost prohibitive. She did have a financial aid check for $700 in her purse, but she wanted to use that to finish her study since she was so close. And so instead, she consulted an unlicensed, cheaper abortionist, and she paid that person $75, and she quickly developed a bacterial infection. She was rushed to an emergency room, but the infection spread, and even though doctors attempted to stop it by giving her an emergency hysterectomy, it wasn't long before she had total organ failure and died. The Hyde Amendment was challenged in courts. Um, you have attorneys for Planned Parenthood uh, of New York City, of the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Center for Constitutional Rights. They filed a class action suit on behalf of women on Medicaid who wanted access to abortion and doctors who accepted Medicaid who wanted to be able to provide abortions. However, the US Supreme Court ultimately decided that states were not required to pay or refund abortions for Medicaid recipients and that the Hyde Amendment did not violate women's constitutional rights. As a result, many other individual states began to follow this course. And according to one report, within a year of the implementation of the Hyde Amendment, the number of federally funded abortions dropped from about 290,000 to 2,000. The Center for Disease Control uh, even conducted an eight-month longitudinal study to determine the effects on restricting access to uh, public funds for abortion. The study had some flaws. It was small. There were other issues that affected its interpretations. 
But they did find that Medicaid women in non-funded states who had complications after abortions, they averaged about 1.9 weeks later gestational age than their counterparts in states that were funded. And Medicaid-eligible women in non-funded states had a 2.4 week later mean gestational age than non-Medicaid women in the same state. So what that basically means is that women who were on Medicaid who had to wait longer to save money to get abortions were at increased risk of death and complications. One week of delay increased complications for a legal abortion by 20% and the risk of death by about 40%. So these women were already at a, a, um, a disadvantage. More recently, and this is related to a lot of what we're seeing now, um, a lot of people often reference Roe v. Wade and overturning Roe, um, but some people would argue that a woman's access to abortion is less protected by Roe and more defined, actually, by Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Now, in 1989, Pennsylvania Governor Bob Casey signed the Abortion Control Act. And this was one of the first attempts by an individual state to restrict abortion access after Roe. It's not the first, but it's one of the first. There were several provisions in this act that were designed to limit abortions, and these included informed consent, spousal notification, parental notification for unemancipated minors, uh, waiting periods, um, and clinics would be required to report all of the demographic data to the state. So when Casey signed this act, it was immediately challenged by a number of abortion providers, counselors, and doctors, and this turned into the class action suit Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It was 1992 by, this time, by the time this case reached the Supreme Court, and attorneys for the appellates argued that the Pennsylvania Abortion Control Act effectively overturned Roe since it imposed so many regulations on women who were trying to receive abortions and on the doctors who were providing them. On the other hand, the attorneys for the defendants argued that they weren't overturning Roe. They just wanted to be judged by an undue burden test. Now, in prior challenges to Roe, the Supreme Court had already decided two things, that the existence of a fundamental right and the enjoyment of a fundamental right were mutually exclusive. Just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean you get to do something. And that since states do have an interest in protecting potential life, they could favor pregnancy and childbirth and adoption and not abortion. So the majority in Planned Parenthood versus Casey held onto the three fundamental tenets of Roe, that women have a right to abortions before viability, that the state has the right to restrict abortions after viability, and that the state has an interest in protecting the life of the woman and potentially of the child. Nevertheless, in their opinions for this case, the majority also opted for an undue burden standard over the existing trimester standard. The undue burden standard is more flexible, and it reflects the state interest in protecting fetal life. The, doctor, or the judges also held that Pennsylvania's restrictions did not constitute an undue burden. So when these judges are moving away from a trimester system that says, you know, abortions are legal from here to here, and you can put some restrictions here to here, when you're now moving towards an undue burden system, it means that states can develop legislation, regulations, and rules and put them into place and they'll exist in place until someone takes that to court to say it constitutes an undue burden. It moves away from the doctor-patient relationship, and it basically puts abortion back into the courts. So abortion does remain legal, but this ruling creates opportunities for new regulation that at least limit abortions or makes them more inconvenient. Does that make sense? So looking more recently, since 2010, the U.S. abortion landscape has become increasingly restrictive as more states are becoming hostile to abortion rights. There were 338 abortion restrictions that were enacted between 2010 and 2016. 30% uh, of the restrictions enacted since Roe v. Wade were enacted in the last seven years. 
Now, more and more legislators are playing on vagueness and abortion laws, playing with viability, but also this undue burden test. Um, the number of abortion providing facilities continues to drop, as well as the number of clinics that are prov providing abortion services. In two, or as of 2019, 58 percent of women of reproductive age live in states that are considered hostile to abortion, uh, while only about 24 million women of reproductive age live in states that are considered supportive of abortion rights. Uh, 25 abortion bans were introduced in 12 states in 2019. That is um, some of what's here. Uh, they vary. Uh, Alabama, for example, attempted to ban all abortions. Other states enact gestational age bans uh, after fetal heartbeat detection or between 8 and 12 weeks or 8 and 18 weeks. Um, some states focus specifically on banning certain types of procedures for abortion um, or reasons for abortion. So some states actually prohibit people from getting abortions if they're doing it because of uh, the child is the wrong sex or the child has Down syndrome or some other kind of genetic anomaly. 27 states require uh, a woman seeking abortion wait a specified waiting period uh, between counseling, mandated counseling, and the procedure. Uh, these usually vary between 24 and 72 hours. Um, and sometimes this means that women have to make multiple trips to the clinic. So if you recall from the documentary that we watched, some of these women are driving five hours to be able to get to the procedure. And they're doing that to bypass the waiting period. Um, or imagine if they have to do that because of the waiting period. They have to do that twice. And 18 states require that a woman receive counseling before having an abortion. So who has abortions in the United States? Um, as this graph illustrates, the US abortion rate actually reached a historic low in 2017. Um, that is about 13.5 abortions per 1,000 women aged 15 to 44. When Roe was decided, that rate was about 16.3 per 1,000 women. The following statistics that I'm going to indicate now, uh, they're from 2014. They're from the Guttmacher Institute. Um, but according to them, about one in four women will have an abortion by the age of 45. 34% uh, of abortion recipients in 2014 were aged 20 to 24, and 27% um, were between the ages of 25 and 29, meaning that more than half of the people who have abortions are in their 20s. 51% of the patients who had abortions in 2014 were using some other method of birth control at the time that they became pregnant, and 59% of them already had children or had previously given birth at some time. Approximately 75% of abortion recipients in 2014 were poor, meaning that they made under the federal poverty level of $15,730 for a family of two, uh, or they were low income, meaning that they made 100 or 199% of the federal poverty level. Globally, concerns over Zika virus in Latin America have also reignited some of these discussions about abortion access in countries where the procedure was completely illegal. Again, we see that this potential for babies being born with severe abnormalities have at least been sufficient to reignite discussion for easing of restriction in these predominantly Catholic anti-abortion nations. However, as of yet, this has not materialized into any new policies. Abortion has remained a, a topic of public debate, but in recent years it has gained more attention through to some of these restrictive legislation acts. And overwhelmingly, these new acts call for mandatory waiting times, parental notification, spousal consent, vaginal ultrasounds, and even preventing the dispensation of the anti-abortion drugs, mifepristin and misoprostol, um, or preventing that in, in clinics that don't have an operating room. And many of these regulations disproportionately affect young women, rural women, women of color, um, and low-income women. And these acts illustrate a failure to recognize that historically abortion restriction has done more harm than good. Despite increased attention, abortion rates in the U.S. continue to decline, and some argue that this is because of better access to other forms of birth control, like the pill, condoms, and IUDs, 
And others argue it's because of increased societal acceptance of single parenthood or even the decreased significance of marriage. Um, but even though abortion rates have fallen, it doesn't mean that this procedure has lost its significance. These laws do not discourage women from submitting themselves to unknown practitioners, toxins, devices. They haven't historically and they won't now. And in their dissemination, these abortion restrictions deny women access to safe hygienic medical procedures, and they simply advance the notion that a woman's body belongs to anybody but herself. Questions? That's it. All right. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.